Good morning and a happy day of Pentecost to all. I'm going to begin by reading some scripture. Today's lectionary text includes a portion of Acts chapter 2. I'm going to set a little context by reading a few verses from Acts chapter 1. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And now I'll begin in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Skipping down to verse 14, it says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. And I will quote just a few lines from Peter's address. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. In this scripture passage, we see how the Pentecost event fulfills both Old Testament prophecy and the promise that was given to the disciples by Jesus. And so the day of Pentecost has always been a significant day in the life of the church and a day that is marked by the church ever since. Christians around the world celebrate Pentecost in various ways. Uh, many Christians wear bright red garments, adorn the church with bright red materials and other colors, streamers, banners, decorations that look like fire, and also many hymns have been written especially for the day of Pentecost. Uh, today I wanted to give you a story, a little bit of background to a Pentecost hymn, and I chose one that is quite new. This text was actually written in 1986. It's called, Come Holy Spirit, Fill This Place. It's number 269 in the Chalice Hymnal, and I have attached to this email a PDF that you can download and print or look at that has the words and the music. In our chalice hymnal, it has a different tune set to these words than the one that I chose, but if you download that PDF, you will see what we're going to be singing. As I tell you a little bit about this hymn, you'll be surprised to find out that there is a connection to Christmas cards and socks for Beethoven. This hymn writer is named Daniel B. Merrick. He was born in Bloomington, Illinois in 1926 and died in Raymore, Missouri in 2004 at the age of 78. He was an ordained minister of the Disciples of Christ and pastored churches in Wisconsin, Illinois, and the Panama Canal Zone. He was a graduate of Phillips University and Phillips Theological Seminary, both in Oklahoma. As a pastor throughout his life, 
he was a bit like Charles Wesley, who we talked about the last time we had a hymn story. He was a hymn writing preacher. He didn't write thousands of hymns the way Wesley did, but he did write dozens of hymns that wound up being published, some of them used in numerous hymnals, some appearing in collections that were published under his own name. Some of his better known hymns are O God of Truth, The Power of Nations Free, which was selected by the Hymn Society of America in 1956 as one of the theme hymns for Christian Youth Week that year. Then in 1966, the Disciples of Christ held an international convention in Dallas, Texas, and Daniel Merrick wrote the hymn that became the theme of that meeting, O God Whose Fullness Overflows. But here's the reason why I should have known Daniel Merrick. Merrick. He was the editor of the Chalice Hymnal, published in 1995, which of course is in the pews at First Christian Church and is the standard hymnal for many of our Disciple of Christ congregations. His 1984 collection is called New Honors for His Name. There are many Advent and Christmas hymns in this collection, and this reflects Merrick's tradition of writing a hymn text for his family Christmas card each year. Wouldn't that be amazing to get a Christmas card and find inside a brand new hymn written just for that year? Within his published collection, there are hymns that were written for a variety of occasions, uh, hymns for weddings, hymns for ordination, hymns for every season and celebration of the church year. He even wrote a hymn for the moon landing in 1969. Now the tune that I chose to put with these words, as I said, is not the tune that appears in the Chalice Hymnal with it. This is a tune that's called Germany and is attributed to a man named William Gardner. It came from a book that he published in 1815 called Sacred Melodies. But who is William Gardner? Well, William Gardner was born in Leicester, England in 1770. His father was an English hosiery manufacturer. And William Gardner took up his father's trade in addition to being an avid musician. He was a musical prodigy, singing and playing instruments from a very early age, and he was a great promoter and advocate of the use of hymn singing in churches. Now, in the course of working in his father's sock-making business, he had the opportunity to travel throughout a large part of Europe and meet some interesting people. Among the interesting people that he met happened to be Joseph Haydn and Ludwig von Beethoven. As it happened, Beethoven and Gardner had both been born in the year 1770. Being the same age, they became close friends and, and uh, visited together a lot of times throughout their lives. So his collections of tunes that he published in 1812 and 1815 were his attempt to create and disseminate some useful, singable, and high-quality music that could be mated with existing hymn texts. Uh, you may know from the history of hymn singing that uh, many churches did not have a hymnal that had both words and music on the same page. They would have collections of texts and there would be a handful of tunes that they knew, and they would just adapt each text to one of those familiar tunes. But he published these collections of tunes that he based on themes that he heard in the music of Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven, whom he greatly admired. One thing you'll notice about this tune is that it is a very complex and well-developed tune. 
Uh, if you were to look at the music, you would see that the complexity extends all the way down to the bass line, which walks up and down the scale using as many as nine different pitches along the way. And this is very unlike the bass line that you see in a lot of other hymns and gospel songs. It also contains a lot of interesting chord structures. You would hear major seventh and other unusual chords that are often referred to as jazz chords. Imagine that, modern music in 1815. One thing I notice about this melody is that it seems to climb a ladder as it moves along. It starts in the lower range of the voice, it goes up a few steps, then it comes back down, then it goes up some more and comes back down, finally ascending into the higher ranges of singing toward the end. It's almost as if the melody pulls us upward into the words. I first heard this tune as a child. This was a tune that was used in Vacation Bible School back in the 60s and 70s. We had an offertory song that we often sang to this tune, All Things Are Thine, No Gift Have We. Some of you may remember that song. Another set of words sung to this is Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. So, as we sing this song, take note of the form of the hymn. Verse 1 is a prayer for the assembled worshipers, including ourselves as we sing it, calling upon the Holy Spirit to come, to fill, anoint, inspire, and guard us, and to be our delight. Verse 2 offers several names for the Holy Spirit. Comforter, gift of God, enlightener, and living well. In verse 3, we are seeking the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. The seven gifts that are mentioned in this verse are wisdom, knowledge, truth, power, counsel, love, and peace. In verse 4 is a prayer for the renewal of this church, commissioned to pursue and proclaim the message of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. 